ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to the Myositis Association's Ask the Doc webinar series. My name is Rachel Bromley and I am TMA Senior Manager of Patient Education, Support and Advocacy. Today we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Tay Chung. Dr. Chung is an Assistant Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Neurology at Johns Hopkins. His areas of training and expertise include neuromuscular disorders, physical medicine, and rehabilitation. Thanks to his diverse background, Dr. Chung is uniquely positioned to diagnose and treat a variety of neuromuscular conditions and pathology by using electrodiagnostic procedures and immune and rehabilitative treatments. Dr. Chung is particularly interested in rehabilitative treatments and therapeutic exercise for various neuromuscular diseases, such as myositis, peripheral neuropathy, and motor neuron diseases. Dr. Chung runs a multidisciplinary rehabilitation clinic with the Johns Hopkins Neuromuscular Rehabilitation Team, which he helped develop with physical, occupational, and speech therapists who are dedicated to helping patients with rare neuromuscular diseases. Dr. Chung, welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for a nice introduction. Um, again, my name is Dr. Chung. Um, I belong to physical medicine rehab department at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, uh, like Rachel introduced, um, I did my fellowship in neurology. So I also have secondary appointment in neurology uh, for neuromuscular medicine. Basically, I'm interested in um, everything that's coming from ner peripheral nervous system and muscle, but um, became much more interested in uh, muscle disease in general. And even within muscle disease, particularly interested in myositis. Uh, in my, at Johns Hopkins, I started, I joined the myositis clinic center at Johns Hopkins when I joined the faculty. And my role there is um, primarily neuromuscular uh, physician. So I do uh, electrodiagnostic study, uh, you know, also known as EMG studies and nerve conduction studies. This is a diagnostic procedure. And I see patients uh, 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 with, you know, kind of various type of myositis, but I became a little more interested in inclusion body myositis just because I have a background in physical medicine rehabilitation. Uh, and, I, uh, and these patients uh, really need a lot of rehabilitation uh, intervention. So uh, for that, uh, because I actually I have a privilege uh, of being in primary uh, phys physical medicine rehabilitation department, so I work. I have an access to great uh, resource for rehab, and I work with a lot of physical and occupational therapists and speech therapists for a swallowing problem. So I brought in when I joined the myositis clinic, I brought in this rehabilitation aspect. So we kind of have a uh, we established team of therapists who are specialized in um, myositis. So it's kind of not that really common to have physical, occupational, and speech therapists that are uh, familiar with myositis. Because as you know, myositis are generally very rare condition. So, uh, but they have, uh, they have very special needs for rehab. So I thought we think it's very important that rehab therapists um, are very knowledgeable uh, with myositis. So I've been running this myositis rehab clinic, neuromuscular rehab uh, team uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, physically located at Bayview uh, campus. So <clears throat> I know we have a lot of questions. Um, I think, um, and I, first of all, I'm going to have to say, I reviewed some of the questions that came in uh, before, and I love the question. I'm so glad that I have just a number of questions that I am passionate to really I'll talk about, but I will let Rachel to start in. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, of course. If anyone in the audience has a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will be going from the questions that were submitted by email back and forth with whatever is in the Q&A box. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. Chen, let's talk a little bit about what physiatry is. Okay, so that was my favorite question. <laughs> and first of all, um, um, I'm gonna actually share the screen just for that answer because that was actually the one question, but that was actually another uh, whole lecture for patients before. 
So I'm not going to go over the lectures, but I'm, I have a kind of few slides that I think is going to be probably helpful. And I think to answer this question, I think it's really relevant to patient care too. So um, um, let me <clears throat> share this. Okay, are you able to see the share screen? There we go. Okay, perfect. So what is physiatry, physiatry or physiatry? Okay, first of all, I'm gonna have to probably say in the field, there's a huge ongoing controversies about how to pronounce it. <laughs> the physiatry or physiatry? Um, I know, well, first of all, it's not psychiatry. So, you know, very, be, be careful. I know a lot of people misspell. And some people think I'm psychiatrist, but if you look at carefully, uh, there's an S is kind of back there. So it's a physiatry or physiatry. All right, so it depends on when you, who, who you're asking. Uh, uh, we have a very senior uh, physical medicine we have doctor. Uh, she feels strongly about pronouncing it as a physiatry, but I know a lot of people pronounce it as physiatry. Uh, but official term for this uh, field is physical medicine rehabilitation, or surely some people call PMNR. Uh, I like all names, but these are all same principle. Um, now, what is physiatry? Physiatry then? Well, I think um, uh, <clears throat> this is actually medical specialty, um, and a lot of people who heard about physiatry or PMNR, uh, they think it's more like uh, MD version of physical therapy. Well, um, to a certain extent, that's not that you know far away from the truth, but it's actually not technically true. Although my parents still believe that I'm doctor version of physical therapist, yeah. but we actually have <laughs> kind of different um, you know background and expertise. So it's going to be usually medical doctor uh, or DO um, who who you know it's actually residency program is actually a specialty uh, board certification there too. Um, you can very simply say PMNR is a specialty. Uh, we are a specialty based on population. So we are, basically, we are basically seeing all patients who have physical or to a certain degree mental, but mainly physical disability. Okay, patients with any disability are the patient for uh, physical medicine rehabilitation. Uh, the good analogy is actually, um, you know, pediatrics. Pediatrics is not a specialty just looking at certain organ like liver or heart. Uh, it's actually population-based um, you know, specialty. So anybody who's a kid, they have a you know, unique need because they're a pediatric patient, they're small, they have a physiological difference there. So they're a specialty that's based on population. Same as emergency medicine as a specialty as well. So we are dealing with patients who have all forms of disability from any kinds of these conditions. Um, so again, uh, it doesn't have to be myositis. It doesn't have to be spinal cord. It doesn't have to be stroke. Anybody as a result, they have a physical disability, then we can see them because, um, you know, we, it would be better if we know the disease, underlying disease of what's causing this disability, but actually it doesn't have to be like that. So I know a lot of people here uh, who are diagnosed with my myositis, uh, let's say they are disabled, um, they'll probably quickly find that there are not many doctors who are even familiar with myositis in their local areas. However, you will be able to find somebody who's in the PMNR department, PMNR as a specialty, and I think I encourage uh, patients to really seek for care from physical medicine rehabilitation doctor, because again, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to necessarily know uh, details about um, uh, the disease itself, okay? So, okay, I know it's a short, a short question, but I'm, I'm gonna stop it here, okay? Uh, that was a long answer for a short question. Yes, but it's so important because that's the starting point. If we don't understand what it is uh, to begin with, it's hard to move forward with our questions. So we really appreciate that. Um, do you feel as if in that question you uh, fully answered what's the difference between a physical therapist and a physiatrist? Um, not, um, um, I'm going to actually so add some more uh, answers. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so certain differences there. 
Uh, you don't have to really understand all the detailed difference about uh, what it is. Um, but basically, so PML doc, uh, I think my best analogy is, that, uh, is you know, pharmacist and, um, you know, uh, the doctor and pharmacist kind of analogy. Okay. So basically, um, a lot of what we do, of course, as a PML doctor, we prescribe medications too. But a lot of what we prescribe is physical therapy, physical forms. Or exercise, or even um, you know braces, those are very physical prescriptions. So <clears throat> oftentimes, this, uh, those prescriptions are not as simple as just writing up you know script pad and give aspirin eighty one milligram or something like that. Our prescription works a little differently and kind of a little complicated. So for example, and I'm gonna go over a little bit uh, with other questions too. For example. Myosite is actually one of the best examples. If I prescribe exercise, you have to do certain type of exercise three times a day um, or for three months or something like that, that's delivered through physical therapists. It's not as, you know, because physical therapists then will evaluate the patients and they have to look at, so for example, if I say some uh, 20 pounds of uh, weight on, the, you know, on your bicep, that's a prescription. Some people may have some arthritis in the elbow or shoulder. There are certain things they can do or cannot do, right? So physical therapists will weigh into that and give actual prescriptions about what to do, okay? So, you know, in a way I prescribe aspirin, but, you know, pharmacists will weigh in drug drug interaction and uh, go over different brands and then pick out actual brands for you. And that's kind of similar to that. So, uh, and there's a little difference between physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy based on what aspects of physical uh, treatment they're getting. So uh, basically, PML doctors are the ones who's prescribing or planning or rehab approach, and PTOT speech therapists are the ones who are actually implementing it. So that's the difference. Thank you. So um, let's say that a patient has decided to add a physiatrist to their um, care team and they go to their very first appointment with you. What can they expect? Uh, that's also a great, great question. Um, you'll probably uh, notice that when you go see a, a lot of physical uh, PMNA doctors on the first day, not only they'll ask, I mean, like any doctors, they'll ask questions about what kind of problem they have, uh, what, when those problems started and how things went, like the history. Uh, but on top of that, one of the most important aspects of our history taking is your home setting too. So how you are doing in terms of, you know, your physical activity, are you walking walker, wheelchair, and even questions including um, how many steps are there in your house? Do you have to go upstairs to go to bedroom? Or bathroom? Are you either a bathroom in the first floor? Um, those are not conventional questions a lot of doctors ask, but this is one of the very important because a lot of we have intervention when you, whether we prescribe physical therapy, wheelchair. It depends on your own personal environment, right? So I wouldn't give, uh, you know, for example, some certain break in somebody who's not walking around. They may not. They just don't want it, you know. And I respect that. Um, and there are some people who, despite having all the diseases, I have a lot of myositis patients uh, who, are on a, who are on a walker, they enjoy going hiking on the beach. And surprisingly, there's a lot of wheelchairs and walkers uh, that are designed to navigate in, you know, hiking on uneven terrain or even beach. And depending on their own, um, you know, personal environment or preference, I can prescribe it. Uh, individually. So uh, we ask a lot of those, what sounds like very in, uh, kind of personal questions, but that's because, you know, that's our job. My, my job is really to increase their function uh, and social integration. Um, the physiatry assessments that are done, are they all done at that first meeting? Uh, it depends on the problem, actually. Um, I mean, okay. it require kind of a few more visits. Okay to go over other things and um, then, you know, typically PTOT plus minus speech therapist will evaluate further into that, uh, but it depends on the problems. Okay. Um, what can a physiatrist diagnose? 
So for dive, I mean, again, like I said, uh, physiatry itself, traditional period doctors are not, um, you know, really to diagnose certain organs. However, uh, if you think about it, most of the disease that, uh, that cause of disability are the ones that affect nerve and muscle function, whether it's a stroke, spinal cord injury, or skeletal muscle problem like myositis or nerve problems. And as a part of our residency program, we are uh, you know, required to train for electrodiagnostic studies such as EMG or nerve contusion studies. So basically, uh, we, uh, most female doctors will be comfortable uh, uh, with diagnosing some peripheral neuropathy or muscle problems. Okay, let's go to the Q and A and um, address some of the questions there. It's been quite controversial if PT could be harmful to necrotizing myopathy. Can you talk about what we need to be concerned when we start a PT program? Yes, uh, and thank you for uh, the question. So, well, the answer is pretty clear. Actually, uh, we have a lot of some evidence and a lot of experience about uh, implementing exercise on myositis, polymyositis, terminal myositis patients, including uh, necrotizing my myositis. And the answer is pretty clear that it's pretty safe. And the concern for damaging muscle with exercise is probably, uh, it's, uh, you know, exaggerated. Uh, for many years, up until a couple of decades ago, it was actually standard of care to not to do exercise when you have uh, some kind of myositis. If you look at the muscle biopsy, there's a tons of muscle degeneration and inflammation there. So using the muscle on those muscles that are damaged uh, doesn't sound it's it doesn't sound like you know uh, it's a safe thing. But I think a couple of decades ago, uh, you know, some people, uh, some pioneers, including our own uh, uh, Dr. Alexander in Sweden, they've done really seminal studies where. They carefully compare the biopsy before and after uh, the exercise intervention, and we know that it's very safe. And, and essentially, um, uh, from a pathophysiological standpoint, there's no, no reason to really uh, make difference between polymyositis, dermatomyositis myositis versus necrotizing myositis. As long as it's autoimmune inflammatory myositis, um, it is very safe, and we know that I mean, I'm one of those people that um, exercise actually is not good for everything or any exercise good for any conditions. And when I started this myositis team, I had very legitimate concern how much, uh, how aggressive we should be in terms of exercise, implementing exercise. But we are actually realizing more and more that we can be actually pretty aggressive and without causing uh, muscle damages. That's good to hear. Um, have you seen any overlap with DM and necrotizing myopathy? How is necrotizing diagnosed? Uh, so, uh, good question. Um, I wouldn't say, I would, uh, by definition, I wouldn't say that I've seen patients with the DM and necrotizing myopathy overlap because dermatomyositis um, actually can be pathologically defined pretty clearly by uh, what is called perifacial uh, um, particular atrophy, uh, which we don't see in necrotizing myositis. So technically, I mean, you could have some rashes on necrotizing my myopathy, which is also very rare. I personally have to say probably um, haven't seen it that's connected with the myositis, but technically you can't, um, you know, um, it's, um, you know, I wouldn't say there's a lot of overlap there between derm the dermatomyositis and necrotizing myositis. Okay, and re returning to the exercise um, subject, um, is it possible in your opinion to build muscle mass back after it's been lost? Um, yes, for sure. Are you talking about from that question, uh, are they referring to specific type of myositis or just in general? Dermatomyositis. A oh, dermatomyositis, okay. Um, <clears throat> The uh, answer is yes, and just to give a little more details about it, um, in my experience, there are basically kind of two types of um, uh, muscle atrophy or weakness associated with dermatomyositis. Obviously, um, you know, your inflammation is attacking the muscle, and that's causing atrophy and, you know, muscle atrophy and muscle weakness. 
However, <clears throat> um, you know, dermatomyositis is inflam inflammatory disease and they have a chronic inflammation. They, they have this inflammation lingering around in their muscle tissue for many years. And chronic inflammation itself can cause some kind of muscle atrophy as well, like uh, plus disuse atrophy. So um, when you start exercise, uh, most patients will have some immediate benefit because uh, muscle strength gain right away. And I think that's coming from reconditioning uh, effects. However, uh, like I said, a couple of decades ago, there's been a lot of studies on exercise and myositis. And it seems like exercise itself has some anti-inflammatory or maybe immunomodulating effects that it actually affects and kind of a calm down inflammation and dermatomyositis that it further improves their muscle quality. Yes, we had uh, someone else asked, are there any activities that would cause a flare in the inflammation, such as overdoing activities or exercise or deep tissue massages? Oh, no, not deep tissue massages is not going to be deep enough to actually um, damage the muscle. And <clears throat> so we don't have, well, um, again, this is actually some, one of those things that's kind of hard to answer in a scientific study way, but it, we kind of depend, uh, we had to rely on our past experience, collective experience. And when I, again, for, when I first started this myositis center and a myositis rehab center, um, there was, a, you know, I was a little bit concerned if I do a lot of my, you know, like, whether they can uh, initiate any flares of myositis, but I I would say I haven't had any case where um, I saw you know flares from the exercise, and that's consistent with other people, such as Dr. Alex Anderson and other people who are implementing exercise aggressively on myositis patients. So um, uh, I, I'm gonna cautiously say it's very unlikely. Uh, that exercise cause any flares for myositis. But you definitely say that it's helpful. Is that correct? It is very helpful. It's been really well known, well studied that exercise is helpful in a way that it improves their muscle strength and decrease some inflammatory markers and polymyositis and dermatomyositis patients. Now, inclusion body myositis is some little different discussion. Um, uh, we know it is safe but the benefit is, has not been well studied in a, in a very you know, controlled way. But with it, by experience, we know that it's gonna work, it kind of works to delay the progression. But that's, that requires some more scientific studies for that. Okay. Um, for patients that are confined to a wheelchair, what yeah. can a physiatrist offer with regards to physical therapy? Oh. <clears throat> There are a lot of different things we can offer too. Um, well, first of all, even start with the wheelchair. And this is one of the things I want to emphasize for a lot of patients out there. Is that, um, especially my studies, a lot of times when they get the wheelchair, the wheelchair prescription actually is, should be very extensive. It's not something simple as just riding wheelchair and then get it. Uh, and I noticed that a lot of patients get on get a, um, the, uh, the scooter, electric, electronic scooter, and they think there's a wheelchair. Electronic scooter and wheelchair are completely different things. And I discourage all the patients from getting electronic scooter. But this day and age, uh, insurance companies, they want to push people to get the scooter because it's much cheaper. I want to make sure that I'm clear on what you're saying, because a lot of patients I know are on scooters. You're saying you're not a proponent of scooters and that people should go from walkers to wheelchairs. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Uh, not, I mean, I'm not saying that people who are already on the scooter that works well should get, should throw away the scooter. I'm not saying that. I mean, if it works. Okay. Um, but okay. I say wheelchair, it has to be actually customized for their own body type and everything. It's a pretty extensive process. So first of all, if you're uh, at a point where you're considering wheelchair, that's actually when you definitely want to see a payment doctor. Again, the payment doctor doesn't have to know the myositis itself, but they know how to prescribe wheelchair. That's a whole another different you know, workout for that. Okay. The, the reason that I don't love scooters is that uh, the safety actually. I mean, it can tip over pretty easily. And um, it can, you know, um, 
you know, it can be a little dangerous. Of course, it can be uh, very useful right. to get around certain places, but um, I just have to tell you that wheelchair and scooter are two different, uh, completely different things. Okay. And okay. Well, let's get back to to mm -hmm. that question. Then you're 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 already in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Then what? Well, then. Um, <clears throat> So just to stick to the answer to that question, um, uh, then I think you want to have somebody, you, you already have a wheelchair, you want to have somebody, especially a female doctor, who can address different things. You notice that whenever you're navigating around the wheelchair, a lot of other things are going to happen. Uh, I mean, it can be just mechanical problems, or depending on your functional status, uh, there are some other things you can add or remove in the wheelchair to help with certain things. A lot of people, for example, uh, uh, polymyositis patient with a proximal weakness, they cannot raise your hand, reach out to different, uh, hard time reach out to, you know, stuff overhead. And there are certain things on the wheelchair they can put and, you know, make it easier to feed or, for, for example, or we can modify a wheelchair in a, that, in a, in a way that uh, there are certain wheelchairs that can elevate the whole seat and up and down so you can reach out to certain things. Now, that also depends on your functional uh, level and, and your situation, whether you're a pe person who's working full time at a certain place, or you're a kind of person who's more sedentary setting, uh, sitting at home. Uh, so you want to have some actually rehab person who's following you up for long term rehab issues when you're already in the wheelchair. Okay. Um, someone asks, what do you think about BFR therapy for IBM? I currently take, co take coaching online. And for those who don't know, BFR is blood flow restriction therapy. Okay. I kind of anticipate that I'm going to get this question. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, my answer for that has been kind of evolving and changing. Uh, when I first heard about BFR, I think a few years back, and from patients and some therapists, I actually didn't like the idea. And, and basically, for those who just haven't heard about BFR, um, you know, there's a theory where you know, basically they're cutting off blood flow to the muscle uh, when they're doing exercise. And why is that? The rationale behind what they claim to do is that they're confusing the muscles. There's a theory which has actually been scientifically kind of um, you know, um, challenge it uh, was that, okay, why do people get stronger and, you know, the muscle get bigger when they do exercise? Uh, one of the theory, again, which has been scientifically challenged is that, well, when you're, you know, basically you're kind of torturing the muscle and the muscles, you know, grew out of the pain, right? Basically the metabolic environment, when they're doing the um, exercise, um, you know, they're, the muscles are adapting to that challenge and get better. So the idea behind the BFR is that they're cutting off the blood flow. So they're confusing the muscle and, you know, creating an environment where uh, muscles are, you know, starving and having a hard time. So they kind of grow from there. So the idea is that when, they, when you cut off the blood flow when they're doing exercise, it can, you know, synergistically optimize their muscle growth there. Um, now, I, I, I don't agree with the rationale, what they're proposing, the scientific rationale behind that. I don't think that's how the muscle grows. Uh, <clears throat> however, I, a lot of my uh, you know, patients and therapists are saying that it seems to work and they really like um, you know, the BFR treatment. They feel like they can do shorter uh, amount of workout and they get the same benefit. And, I'm, and at the end of the day, I may, uh, like the rationale may be wrong, but you know, I do really respect their clinical experience from therapists and patients. So I'm kind of carefully listening to them. All I have to say is that there may be some benefit, I don't know, but just be careful when you implement BFR, because if you cut off too much of uh, blood flow, it can be a little dangerous to you. It can cause actually compartment syndrome, rhabdomyolysis. So, um, a lot of companies have some kind of measurement where you can, you know, carefully control the uh, pressure that you apply to strict the blood flow. So as long as you're careful about that, I think I'd like to see what's going to, what other, you know, future studies show um, with the benefit of BFR. 
Thank you. We have a retired physician with IBM in the audience, and that person has found that an increase in size of the muscle from exercise does not necessarily increase strength, but does slow the progression of the disease. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, and um, you know, I really like the question because um, um, no, like regardless of IBM, um, actually, in after a certain age, um, you know, generally speaking, size and function are not you know uh, match, especially when it comes to muscle. So, for example, there's actually a curve there. When you're younger, especially growing up, development, adolescent, bigger muscle means. Um, you know, higher power. However, after a certain age, especially middle age, the uh, the power and size dissociates. So, meaning, uh, you know, bigger muscle doesn't necessarily mean they're stronger. Okay, so become size doesn't matter anymore. So after a certain age, um, and that's <clears throat> so, uh, and that's the truth for IBM because IBM I see IBM is about facilitating aging. Um, and that's, that actually holds truth for IBM. And I, I, I think one of the uh, really important, interesting aspects of that is actually previous experience with certain medications, with, such as Bima Grumer. Uh, those are the medications that's known to increase muscle size or help from atrophy. Uh, and, and, you know, that medication actually successfully, um, you know, uh, prevented muscle atrophy, but fail to show any preservation of muscle strength. And I think that's because you know, uh, any interventions that, that can keep the muscle of size doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to prevent um, the muscle weakness. And that's a consistent theme across you know, aging muscle, including IBM. Okay, we have a question um, that was emailed in that I think affects a lot of people with myositis, and it's about driving and knowing when to stop driving. This question, um, are people with myositis allowed to drive? My family wants me to stop even though I've had no issues till now. I'm still capable of walking. Can I still drive? Now, I know you can't answer that question for that person because you don't have all the information, but what guidance do you have in general for patients wondering when should they turn in their keys? Um, so yeah, uh, obviously this has, this has to be very individualized. And also, this is one of the reasons that why you want to see either PIMA doctor or more like physical therapist or for driving evaluation. Now, generally speaking, um, when it comes to driving, uh, driving, walking, especially driving, doesn't require a lot of muscle power. So, uh, and actually, driving is more about the sensory response, right? You have to look at what you know surroundings and you know react to the surroundings and everything. So it's more about the sensory function more than motor function. So I noticed that a lot of uh, myositis patients, whether it's IBM or PMDM, they can drive, um, you know, quite well until this is progress, uh, until this is advances a lot. Um, um, but generally speaking, IBM patients because their hand weakness and you know distal leg weakness, they have a harder time keeping the driving capacity than uh, polyorthomyositis. Uh, now, I mean, although they're doing pretty well, uh, because a myositis, you know, it doesn't affect the sensory function, they can drive pretty well. But still, especially IBM patients, when it's getting more and more, and more advanced, you know, um, it can be very really dangerous. And, and not, uh, not just for you, for also other people on the road as well. And, um, I think the concerning portion of this driving is uh, the reaction part, you know, because, um, uh, you know, with the muscle weakness, it can be a little slower, especially with the uh, in inclusion body myositis patients. They have thigh weakness and also ankle weakness. And they're having ankle weakness, and they may not be able to react fast enough to break or accelerate. And um, Honestly, I'm not gonna say exactly what time, when, what's the point where you have to report to the motor vehicle, you know, administration or other people. I wouldn't say I don't know. That's more, I guess, a legal question than medical question. But
but I mean, uh -huh. the patients they all know whenever they are having some difficulties. What I want to say is that uh, there are a lot of adaptation for that, so you don't have to hide it from other. Uh -huh. people. Like for example, uh, then also sometimes some, some insurance can cover some ad, uh, modification as well. So let's say if you're a Libyan patient, uh, you can you don't have a lot of ankle movement, but you, then you can have a lot of modification where you can put something in your handle. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people have a hand weakness, but there's some little equipment where you can, you know, some kind of hook you can drive, and also you can, you know, make the brake and accelerator um, with the mm -hmm. hand operation as well. Um, again, depending on the insurance, they can be partially covered as well. So don't be shy about that and ask around. Um, and did I hear you correctly that a physical therapist can do a driving evaluation for you? Yeah, a lot of physical therapy places have this program for driving evaluation. That's actually usually a uh, Some people can do a casual, just, just casually driving evaluation, but usually... Usually it's a formal program, it's called driving evaluation. And you can ask for that too, but you don't have to do formal driving evaluation unless the, uh, the DMV or driving uh, administration, uh, they, they request for that because usually it's not a uh, kind of service. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is just ask physical therapists about you know, driving capacity and driving rehab. And Thing. Right. But it may be something that this particular person wants to get just to get their family off their back. <laughs> so <laughs> they may want to say, see, I got an evaluation and I'm good to go still, you know. Well, you, you want to get the handicap for sure. I mean, I, I, I doubt any doctors not going to, you know, write this mm -hmm. for um, myositis patients. Um, we've got a question here about treatments for pain. Mm -hmm. um, if a patient with myopathy has pain, mm -hmm. um, what should they be careful of? And what do you think does work? Okay, so um, generally speaking, I mean, textbook description of myositis is painless weakness. So not supposed to have pain, but of course, uh, we, notice a lot of, uh, we notice a lot of patients have a pain. And also, um, it uh, and I kind of, you know, uh, kind of classify different groups of different types of pain. So for example, well, first of all, again, myositis itself doesn't cause pain. I mean, mostly doesn't have that much of pain receptor. If you have like inflammation, uh, pain coming from the muscle burning from inflammation, that's very deep, big pain. And you're gonna feel, instead of like sharp pain, you feel those pain, a little more deep burning, kind of cramping kind of pain. That's usually not severe, severe, but we notice that some dermatomyositis patients, they have a little more pain than others. And of course that can be, uh, if this is coming from inflammation, the muscle itself, uh, just typical, you know, immunosuppressant that you're on, you know, whether it's IVIG or methotrexate uh, or Imuran, that can be helpful. Now, if they're careful, I feel like more common type of pain is secondary kind of pain because they are weak. Uh, so for example, uh, with the proximal muscle weakness um, and they're walking a little differently and they're rubbing their, you know, kind of joints a little more uh, when, they're, they, when they walk and they can cause a lot of hip pain or back pain or, you know, some trochanteric pain. That's because their, their gait pattern has altered and that's giving more stress to their joints. So, uh, looking for that, you know, kind of cause for pain is actually really, really important because, for example, if this trochanteric pain, uh, there's some simple injections to bursa uh, or some physical therapy for back pain uh, and so on. So it's really important to kind of try to tease out what kind of pain that you're having related to myositis. All right, let me check in the Q&A and see what we have. Um, this person has had some heart palpitations recently, and they understand that typically IBM does not involve the heart, but they are curious if you have encountered any connection of heart palpitations in IBM patients. No, not really. Um, and, you know, IBM, we know about the IBM, um, you know, it's, it's uh, for a lot of patients, it's kind of scary disease to hear about because there's no drug uh, they can, you know, uh, modify their disease course and everything. 
However, we know that actually it doesn't affect any viral organs. Um, and, you know, uh, it seems to affect skeletal muscle and to a certain extent, maybe sensory nerve as well, but it's largely muscle problem. And if you're having palpitation, uh, I would strongly recommend that they see cardiologists for that. Okay, um, this person has dermatomyositis and has tried Tai Chi classes to build strength. Um, they were never able to succeed and gave up. Should they keep trying? Oh yeah, absolutely. Tai Chi is an amazing core strengthening exercise modality. Um, and you know, um, what I'm gonna probably have to say is that I want them to continue Tai Chi, however, if certain position or uh, you know, motion for Tai Chi is too difficult, um, I, I advise that they have to kind of scale back a little bit and try to do more basic level core strengthening, build up more core strengthening before they go back to Tai Chi. But Tai Chi is a great exercise in general. Thank you. Um... Let's see, people who have some form of myositis have chronic fatigue. Besides exercise and moving the body daily, what else can I do to help lessen the effects of chronic fatigue? Should we be looking for anything in our blood work results as well? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say that. Of course, well, chronic fatigue uh, is very generic term. So, you know, having IV, just having diagnosis of IBM doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have a chronic fatigue. In fact, you may have a muscle fatigue, but if you're a systemic, if this is systemic fatigue, I'll probably just look for more other potentially other causes of um, you know chronic fatigue. Um, you know, given that especially IBM affects more elderly population, uh, they can have a lot of other conditions as well. So I think if you're having <clears throat> more systemic fatigue, I definitely um, encourage you to people to go see their primary doctor, cardiologist or endocrinologist, just make sure that they uh, find, um, you know, rule out some other, excuse me, underlying conditions. Uh, I noticed that some primary doctors or some other doctors, they don't know much about IBM. And when, when, when they are complaining of fatigue, they see this uh, IBM diagnosis, they just kind of defer to die IBM. I would probably say chronic fatigue in IBM is relatively you know, uncommon, unless it's purely muscle fatigue, okay? Now, if you're talking about the just muscle fatigue, there are actually a number of things that we can do, and there are actually reconditioning exercise uh, that can be done, um, and this combination of uh, strengthening exercise and cardiovascular exercise, such as, you know, treadmill or stationary bike or swimming kind of exercise. And also when it comes to you know, muscle fatigue, uh, you want to do some heavier weight, less frequent kind of exercise uh, on the joints that you're targeting. What is your opinion on um, diet and nutrition to help myositis? Um, honestly, I um, generally speaking, there's no, not much uh, evidence uh, you know, for or against any specific type of diet, uh, diet and supplements. So um, I actually don't have a lot of strong opinions about it. I just wanna say that try to avoid anything extreme, anything that kind of uh, balanced diet is probably important. Um, um, I know there's some studies about creatinine or protein rich diet in IBM patients, but still not, uh, I wouldn't say it's like in you know, high level scientific studies, um, and, you know, I, I just encourage people to just remain on balanced diet in general. What is your opinion on acupuncture as it may help myositis? Uh, I don't think acupuncture is going to help anything directly on the myositis. The acupuncture, the mechanism of acupuncture is really well known and their effects is on the pain control. It, it's one of those interventions uh, that addresses pain uh, without having some systemic medications. So uh, if you have some pain and don't want to take a lot of, you know, uh, those pain medications, acupuncture can be a helpful adjunct to your pain management, but it's not, uh, there's no reason to think it's going to do anything uh, 
on the myocytes itself. We talked a little bit about um, maintaining mass or building mass uh, in other myositis uh, subtypes, but this person has necrotizing myopathy and they want to know, can you rebuild the actual damaged or dying muscles? Yes. So <clears throat> again, necrotizing myositis is not just one disease. It's more like pathological description. It looks a little different from a typical poly or dermatomyositis from their muscle biopsy. But clinically, they look just similar to those of polymyositis or dermatomyositis. And as in poly or dermatomyositis, I mean, technically, you can classify those under polymyositis, depending on how you define polymyositis. But, <clears throat> but um, they do respond well to strengthening exercise, um, and they can build up their muscles there too. Assuming that necrotizing myopathy the muscle biopsy uh, is coming from uh, autoimmune disease because you can see some necrotizing myopathy similar looking muscle biopsy from some genetic muscle dis disorders um, and you know and certain genetic disorders you don't want to do that kind of crazy exercise you can actually damage the muscle so just want to make sure that it's autoimmune uh, muscle disease not genetic. Okay. We have um, someone that was a competitive bodybuilder prior to uh, being diagnosed with dermatomyositis. They lost most of their muscle, but still train every day with little or no muscle gain. And they are curious about uh, the drug Androgel or a similar prescription. Would that help with regaining some muscle loss? I think the evidence uh, on the pretty weak. So I, to be honest, the answer is I don't know. Um, theoretically, androgen, uh, the, uh, the male sex hormone uh, can build up the muscle and so on. So um, I don't have any kind of strong positions about it. Um, generally speaking, I'll probably wait, say, wait until better research shows any good results, but I don't have any strong um, opinions about it or don't have any strong reason to think it's going to actually be really helpful. Thank you. I'm just going over our questions to see what we, we've answered all the ones in the Q&A. If you have a question, please add it to the Q&A, but we have more that have come in from email. We have someone that um, has been diagnosed with IBM and tried many drugs, all of which doesn't work for me. And they want to know if you have any treatment in your clinic. Oh, in, for IBM? For IBM, yes. Well, except for the you know, drugs and clinical trial or the research basis, um, uh, what we usually do, um, basically two approaches. And one um, is, uh, kind of intervention to address the IBM itself. And you know, as you know, there's no drug for that. And we think exercise is the only thing that may be delaying the course of uh, progression of IBM. Uh, what we usually do is that they, they are debilitated. They have a lot of rehab issues. So I see them follow them up, usually at least a couple of times a week to address swallowing problem, or certain, you know, braces or wheelchairs and canes or other issues too. Now, going back to intervention for IBM itself, I assume the question is about what are the things, what is there anything that can do that. Now, I'm gonna give you a little different uh, perspective about it, and and this is something that I tell all my patients when they come to my clinic for IBM, is that, well, again, as I said, IBM to me is more facilitated eating process. Uh, anybody without IBM, uh, as we grow older, our muscle function declines, right? But in IBM patients, whatever that is, the, the aging process in the muscle has been exaggerated. It declines much further. So given that, uh, I actually think it's, uh, we won't be able to find the cure or meaningful drug intervention until we find what's causing aging or aging muscle, okay? Which is pretty big task, right? But still, 
Uh, this is actually well, uh, kind of my you know, main area of research, with, uh, which is aging muscle. And there's a lot of kind of research going on to understand from the molecular standpoint, what's causing muscle weakness with aging. Um, um, and, you know, and with the goal of you know, coming up with the actual drugs to intervene it. But there are basically two things that we know that can delay uh, the aging process, process in general, uh, and even the lifespan on animal level, which is uh, calorie restriction and exercise. Okay, and in animal level, if you eat you know, a calorie and exercise the mice, then uh, their lifespan extends by almost 30, 40 percent, which is huge. So, uh, and there's no other drug that I know or you know can extend the lifespan, right? Um, so, of course, uh, calorie restriction on people with IBM is going to be actually pretty controversial and it's going to be very dangerous. It can be dangerous, especially with the elderly population in human. So that's a little different thing. But that's why this exercise, I think, holds um, you know, kind of some truth uh, why it may delay the progression even in IBM because it can even delay the progression of weakness in just normal aging as well. So I want you to think about exercise as a very important, promising uh, intervention for IBM until we have something else. Um, we also have someone that has polymyositis and their quadricep atrophied drastically. And they've tried exercise and they started to take up swimming. Um, what are their chances of regeneration? So, it's a little unusual for polymyositis patients to acquire quadriceps weakness. And I wonder if this is a kind of turning into inclusion by myositis or not. We see sometimes, um, you know, in the beginning of IBM or polymyositis, it turns into IBM. Um, now, to, just to answer the question, I mean, either cases, exercise will be great. But for, for polymyositis, actually benefit of exercise a little more immediate. And IBM. IBM, the goal of exercise is to delay the most progression, not to get stronger right away. Um, and from that perspective, either way, is, um, you know, exercise, is, I mean, the swimming is an amazing exercise for cardiovascular purposes, but it's not the best exercise for individual muscle strength because, you know, it's anti gravity. Um, so the muscles don't, individual muscles don't work against, you know, the resistance. So especially for quadriceps, uh, you want to probably separate uh, exercise just to address the uh, quadriceps. Okay, so you're saying swimming isn't, well, great, isn't perhaps the best in that particular scenario. Right. I mean, it's a great exercise for IBM patients to have cardiovascular uh, training because their muscles are weak, not running the treadmill and so on. So probably swimming is one of the modalities that allows them to do that. But please don't expect that the quadriceps muscle is gonna get stronger or better with the exercise. There's a thing about the exercise that unless you use a specific muscles and challenge them, that's not gonna get better. But a lot of times they do swimming and they kind of feel better because of the exercise, but it doesn't, that benefit is for cardiovascular function, but not for quadriceps or each individual muscle. Okay, we've got a question about protein. Uh, does protein help build muscles in people with myositis? So uh, you cannot generalize it, uh, but like I mentioned, there's some study on IBM patients who've done protein and creatinine diet and have shown some changes um, in, in the past. But, um, you know, again, like the scientific uh, kind of scrutiny of the level of that uh, scientific study, it's kind of a little bit questionable. So I don't... But at the same time, you know, high protein diet uh, is really, you know, kind of encouraged for a lot of people in various age groups. And also there's a lot of reason to think that as you're doing more exercise, build up more muscles um, and having protein uh, is going to be very important because protein is a building blocks of muscles. So of course, especially as you're doing exercise, I would encourage people to do more, turning into more high protein diets. Okay, so I have the money question, Dr. Chung. I have, um, well, I know a lot of myositis patients, they have many uh, physicians on their care team. 
Uh, some of them have different specialties. And I know a lot of them go to so many doctor appointments and it can be very tiring. So we really want to know when is evaluation by a physiatrist warranted? Like what, why should we add more doc appointments to our calendar basically? Oh, yeah, that's a, a very, very, uh, very good question, okay? Well, like I said, I want to emphasize one more time, the physiatrist is especially based on population with the disability. So if you have any functional problem, okay? Um, I mean, not anything, I mean, that's, um, you know, I don't know, for example, like I, mean, I have a lot of patients with IBM, they cannot write or type anymore, but then they're retired and they're not really doing any computer work serious. And if that doesn't really affect their life function, you know, you don't have to see them, right? But overall speaking, if, you're, if your life is affected, you're disabled, you're functionally challenged. Again, you don't have to see a doctor or female doctor who know about IBM or myositis particularly, but still um, you want to see them uh, and you know to see if there's any additional help. You'd be surprised to learn uh, there are so many great ideas or things that you can do um, you know, without actually curing the IBM. So so basically you're saying if you have, um, if your disease is manifesting in a type of disability that affects your life, then you should see a physiatrist and it's okay if they're not an expert on myositis. Am I getting that correctly? Right. Yeah. And especially if physical functions, for example, like if you're falling too much, not walking right, getting in and out of a house or car is very difficult or swallowing is difficult, that functional uh, physical function problems, challenge. That's when you probably want to consider seeing a physiatrist. And we take very practical approaches for that. Thank you so much. Do you have any last minute words for everyone, Dr. Chang? I mean, nothing particular. I mean, all the questions are pretty amazing. I was so surprised and impressed <laughs> to see all these great questions. So thank you for asking amazing questions. Well, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate the work you do and your uh, participation in this webinar. Um, thank you so much. And we look forward to having you again in the future. Thank you very much. Have a great one. All right, everyone. We hope to see you for next month's Ask the Doc. That will be on Thursday, October 20th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time when we will host rheumatologist Dr. Leslie Sackett-Koo. We also have a special Ask the Doc series webinar airing in October, all in Spanish. This is to honor National Hispanic Heritage Month. That special webinar will be on Thursday, October 13th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern. For TMA, I am Rachel Bromley. Good night.